Okay, Keith Haring. <clears throat> this is a crowd favorite. Every young person I know loves Keith Haring. All right, he's amazing. Um, this man was a machine. Um, now, Sean Michelle Bosquet needed Andy Warhol to kind of help elevate his uh, his career. Keith Haring was in the same scene as Sean Michelle Bosquet, but the thing about Keith Haring. Um, he did get a nod from from Andy Warhol, and Andy Warhol loved his work. But he was so different and so ambitious and educated that he quickly rose to the top by himself. He didn't need Andy. Now Andy approved him and said he's great, and and that's all it took is Andy just saying he's great to become popular. And now what he was known for doing is his graffiti all throughout the city. And then his graffiti took him to the next level. Um, he started doing prints, drawings, paintings, um, and he quickly went to the top. Now, uh, his story is going to be very traumatic. Um, I will be talking about sexual connotation in this little portion. Um, just know that as you're going through that this is going to get a little graphic in some areas. Just on imagery based alone. All right, next piece. Okay, so I, there's a video down below, and it talks about him getting arrested in New York on doing subway art, and it's amazing, you know, Channel 5 News is filming him, and there they are, arresting him right then and there on the street, and then, of course, at, at the end of the video, it shows him having an art show, and he made a few thousand, or hundred thousand dollars in a show in 1980, and so that's great, okay, that he makes his money, but it's kind of and it's, it's kind of crazy. He's getting arrested for doing chalk drawings on a subway uh, platform. And it's not like he's spray painting like Banksy in today's time. He's not destroying the, uh, the, the place. He's using chalk, which could easily be washed off, which is just kind of interesting. Now, he does do painted murals as well. Uh, but that was more when he got in his popularity. But we'll get into that as we keep going. <clears throat> what is his images mostly about? It's humanity. It's simple. That's all it is about. And these two pieces right here kind of scream humanity. We are always in this state of mind. We're in two states, okay? We're, we're either in the state of love and relationships, okay? Or we're in the other state of searching for love, okay? Um, eHarmony makes tons of money on this kind of searching for love, okay? There's thousands of people on that site trying to find love, all right? Love is one of those things that's genuine, all right? It, it's, it's something that is taught to you um, but it's easily accepted as a child. Um, uh, I, I truly believe in the idea of love. Uh, my wife and I, we've been together for, this will be our 20th year coming up. Um, and so, and I'm not very old, and so we're high school sweethearts. <laughs> so, um, but, and, and people look at us kind of like, how, wow, can you, how can you love somebody for 20 years and be like, it's just that it, our love is perfect and I love it. And, uh, but I, I do see people searching for love. I've had friends that have, have, have had trouble in relationships and they keep going in and out of relationships um, until they find that right person. Some people get it like me right off the bat. It, 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 just, it just depends on that, what I consider that soulmate. And his artwork kind of plays with that. Um, he's also, he's from a religious background. Both his parents are pastors. And so he, he worked for the church with his family. Uh, he understands the church. So he's kind of doing this spiritual kind of art where it's like, could be also if you're religious, the love of Christ or the love of God. And so, so this is kind of an interesting body of work that a lot of people just accept. When you see it, you fall in love with it, no pun intended. Okay. Then you have here. Okay, so here is um, a family. Okay, now now the characters in the other one were, were, were black lines with, with white. Now, he colors the characters green, um, yellow, red, and blue. 
All right. Uh, the green characters are typically the adults in, in his imagery. The yellow characters are typically the children. And the red and blue are like siblings. Okay. So uh, if you have brothers and sisters, you understand. Sometimes your siblings, you love them. But sometimes you just want to knock their blocks off. Um, and so the siblings are either very, very endearing to each other and very close, just like a relationship. Or they are very aggressive and they fight. Or sometimes they're competitive, like you see the ones in here. Now, the red and blue ones, it's interesting. A lot of people, when, this, when these pieces were made, a lot of ideas of race came into play came into play and yes they are opposing colors but I don't think he was a thinking I don't think he was putting in that idea of race uh, at initially and then as people evaluate your work and break it down over and over it starts to get this kind of um, uh, it gets kind of broken down so much that I think the artist sometimes doesn't even realize why they're making certain pieces certain ways after a while. Okay, um, so now the there's a little trailer here, uh, University of Keith Haring. Uh, this is a documentary. It's it, there is an online uh, video that's out there. It's also on Netflix. I've seen it on there a few times. Uh, Netflix does a pretty good job on art films uh, that I talk about through here. Um, it's one of my guilty little pleasures is watching documentaries. Uh, my wife falls asleep on the couch and I'm watching TV with her, and then all of a sudden I'll click on Netflix and I'll watch a. Um, uh, a documentary. Um, I know that sounds exciting, but I actually enjoy rather. I'd rather enjoy watching a documentary than than read a book. Sometimes, um, being dyslectic, it's a little hard sometimes to to read and uh, focus at the same time. Um, so now, this work is about to change right here. Everything I've shown you probably feels pretty good. You probably like it a lot. Okay. The meanings are going to totally twist on you. Okay. In 1983, I believe, or 84, he found out he was HIV positive. And um, he came out uh, to the public saying that he had AIDS. And he did this whole safe sex campaign. Okay. And then immediately, all of his art that was at the beginning, like the one here for love, okay, Immediately, that love uh, piece pieces were used in churches and places that that he was proud that they were there, and Catholic churches were using it. But the moment he came out saying that he is gay and he has HIV, uh, churches and other places started pulling his imagery out of their office spaces or or hotel or lobby spaces, and um, and. Uh, also, um, churches were taking the, his image out of their uh, out of their space as well. And then he came out, and I and I think this is what's so interesting. He comes out saying this to the to the mass people. He goes, especially for the church part. He says, "You're not supposed to judge another person." All right, and he says, "If you're judging me on my person on on who I am, that's fine." Uh, if you want to judge me, but to judge my art and when you first bought it and you see it as two heterosexual people and then you find out I'm homosexual and then you take it and you go, well, those are two gay men or two or two lesbian women and you take that into consideration then at this point after you know who I am and he goes, that's where you're judging uh, yourself and you're judging what this is about and I think he was right I don't think you should uh, if your original thought was this and then you find out who the artist is and you find out that doesn't matter now it, it will people have that stipulation sure it's gonna be there but I think when he's when he went after the church and said that he was right okay you're judging him not uh, not the art okay and so here it's supposed to be, you know, and he even comes in the documentary in the in that uh, Keith Haring universe 
um, documentary. He talks about one of his two of his best friends that are trying to adopt a child, and they're there are two gay men that want to adopt a child, and they do get to adopt a child. So, so this piece was intended for that. But, again, these are simple humanity forms, okay? And if you see those and you judge it that way. Now, when it came to the safe sex ad, okay, was, was this controversial? Yes, extremely controversial. Um, Andy Warhol, who, had, who has AIDS at that point, and artists know that, but he never came out and really said he had AIDS. Um, he told Keith Haring, he goes, this is career suicide. You are at the top of your game. Just keep doing what you're doing and keep it quiet about this. And he said to, to Andy Warhol, he goes... I have AIDS, and if I would have known the things I know now after having AIDS, I would have protected myself differently. And so he he decided to focus a lot of his career at the end on this safe sex campaign. Um, and he I don't know if he realized he was trying to if he was trying to hopefully find a cure before he passed away. But I don't know what he what his overall goal was. I think mostly it was about awareness, but it might have been something else. Now he gave out these these prints you see here um, of these men, and he sent this the these prints throughout all of the universities throughout the United States, and he asked everybody all the universities. If you allow me to come to your university and talk on your behalf uh, about safe sex, I will give you a free art piece for your university. And it's amazing how many no's he got. Almost all of them were no except two. The one, one place that said yes was Berkeley in, in uh, California. That's no shock. The other place might shock you, okay? I'm from Texas. I've been born and raised. The University of Texas agreed to have him come down. I think they wanted the art piece is really what it boiled down to. And so he came, gave a talk, and the overall uh, talk was wonderful. Everybody came out know, knowing a lot more. And I think because of things like what he was doing with these talks, uh, more and more people came out like Magic Johnson um, and Arsenio Hall made a video shortly afterward about safe sex. And so it brought an awareness that, okay, this is what's happened, but do you hide in, in under your covers or do you come out and talk and help others? Um, and so he wanted to set up a program, this AIDS research program uh, and so he opened up a shop and it's still there today in uh, Manhattan I think it's on 43rd and Canal Street if I'm not mistaken if you're in New York you might know it better um, I've been there once um, and it's amazing uh, when you walk into the space it still looks like it does in that picture over on the left. And you can get from a t-shirt to a toothbrush, a mug, a shower curtain, um, with his image on it. Okay? Now, the only problem I have with this whole setup, and I'm going to just get off that page for you guys. I know some people get uncomfortable uh, with those two gentlemen. Um, what I have a problem with is... At the at his shop at his, at his store, um, ninety percent of his T-shirt sales and everything he sells goes to AIDS research. Okay, ten percent of it goes to the employees and the management to keep the doors open. The Metropolitan Museum uh, bought the the building where it's at, so they never have to put, worry about rent, so to speak. Um, they just have to worry about utilities. Um, but the most important thing is that, that I got out of all that is how is he's given away his art so so he can make money for his charity, which as an artist, that's really honorable what he's doing. Now, the problem I have, and if you heard me at the beginning talking about Urban Outfitters, uh, about three years ago, uh, 2013, I believe, Urban Outfitters did a whole Keith Haring t-shirt campaign. And I got online to see if uh, if they were donating um, money for Keith Haring's t-shirts to AIDS research. And I found out they were not. And so uh, this man's dying wish is to have his imagery 
help help support and here is a company a big name company and they're taking his art okay and they're not giving it proper due what what the artist would want he would want most of those proceeds from that t-shirt to go to um, to AIDS research now I don't know if they paid somebody in his family for the rights of his imagery to be made of t-shirts um, and then maybe they gave that money to AIDS research I don't know but there's nowhere online it says anything until I see something I boycotted that from the moment I saw it I just and, and it's amazing every student I saw uh, during that time was wearing those t-shirts and I was and, and the image you see was like especially the one right here where they're dancing um, was really popular and um, and so it just kind of makes me sad that this man wanted to do something with his imagery and here's a company totally going against what he was what he what he's for and so and again I think people miss it some miss the mark on what they're doing um, they they just focus so much on the overall sales and don't and don't consider what what the objects are about now absolute vodka did a whole series now um, he did a hundred images and then made a copy and he, he printed each copy and most of them were silk screens and lithographs and um, and so he did a whole series of prints and he gave one copy to Absolute and then he gave the other copy uh, for Absolute to sell okay and he did and he wants absolute every year uh, around February March is when they do the sale and uh, they do an auction okay for the first for the first print okay and they he basically made a deal with absolute if you do uh, uh, you talk about AIDS awareness and you give money to uh, AIDS awareness um, I will give you these prints and you can sell one print uh, for AIDS awareness and you can sell the other to make back all the money you have you've done for advertising and Absolute Vodka agreed to do it and they got a hundred years worth of prints and every year they've been selling them and so we're now close to our we're getting close to our 30th year or so there's been 30 prints released and um, and it's quite amazing uh, how much money, because the last print uh, sold to Bill Gates for $30 million. And so I, I would like to see what the, um, what the final 100 print is going to go for. I can't even imagine. Um, it, it will be interesting. Um, interesting to see it at the end. Uh, I won't be able to, but somebody will. <laughs> so I'll be dead by then. Um, now here's some of his performance or his uh, outside pieces. Um, this one's actually in Houston, uh, next to the Glassell Museum. Uh, I was walking by. I didn't even know he did sculpture. So sometimes, like I even miss things. But I know enough about art history when I see something. It's amazing that you know you study this person and then you see something you've never seen before. And so. He, uh, I don't know if this is a recreation or if he actually in, uh, commissioned to do this piece um, of the of the boy in the uh, uh, blue and the uh, red fighting. And then here is one of his murals that's actually in permanent display. They put plexiglass over it in um, uh, what you call it Central Park um, and. Every day, someone goes over with a sharpie um, over that plexiglass. Uh, it's kind of shocking that uh, so many vandalists um, vandal this piece. And the truth is, is he was basically uh, he gave them the voice to do all that stuff, and then they turn around and van. I'm almost surprised they don't treat it like a shrine uh, in the graffiti world. But like I said, not everybody's educated in the arts. Now here's an interesting twist, okay, for, and it's the final piece for Keith Haring. Um, Andy Warhol got money doing uh, an image of Mickey Mouse, the one you see on the right. 
Now, when he did this image of Mickey Mouse, uh, it was a very popular piece. And this tells you the, the power Andy Warhol had. Mickey and Disney, okay, Disney is like a juggernaut in today's time. And if you did anything to tick off Disney, it, they would sue you in a heartbeat. And here in, in, the, in the late 70s, uh, here's Andy Warhol doing a version of Minnie, uh, Mickey and instead of suing him, they paid him for the copyright to reproduce this image. And, and so every time that they reproduce it still today, money goes into Andy Warhol's accounts. And uh, a few years ago, they did thousands and thousands of bags. So he got millions for... And, and again, it's so funny because this is Disney's character. And they had to pay him to use it. So that's which is kind of funny. Um, now, Andy Mouse uh, is an image you see over on the left. Okay, This piece is important because uh, when Andy Warhol got the money from Disney, and uh, you got to understand, Andy Warhol... I mean, uh, Keith Haring was just obsessed on finding money for AIDS research. And this is kind of a, a, a shock because Andy wanted um, uh, to just kind of put the money into something. He didn't know what. And here comes Keith and saying, you need to put this in AIDS research. It's a lot of money that could do a huge amount of good. And Andy's response to Keith is like, what has AIDS ever done for me except kill me? And, of course, Keith got upset. And he said, I want you to give the money. I think it would be really good. And he go, and, then, and then Andy said something to Keith that was kind of probably honest. As most honest. He says, you've gotten assessed on, on this mission, and I think you've lost the voice for your art because you focus so much on this. And I would say that part of that is true. Okay? And then uh, shortly later... Um, uh, Andy Warhol did pass away, but before they, he passed away, um, Keith Haring left that interview and that, that meeting, and it was the last time they ever talked uh, before he passed away. And um, and Keith Haring did these versions of Mickey uh, Andy Mouse, where Andy Mouse is being decapitated, shot, stabbed, thrown off a cliff. Um, oh run over by a car, um, squished, <laughs> hundreds of Andy Mouse be being killed. And it really hurt Andy Warhol's feelings. And uh, Keith, uh, Keith Haring's response to it was, until you give money to AIDS research, I will continue to make these Andy Mouses. Well, like I said, Andy Warhol passed away, and Keith Haring showed up at the will reading. And when he, sh he showed up at the will reading, it was quite interesting. Um, what Andy set aside for Keith Haring is he set up all the money from the Disney fund and he set it aside for AIDS research. And he had set it up from the get-go. All right. I think the way that Keith Haring came at him saying, you must give me the money... Uh, ticked him off, but the money was going into AIDS research from the get-go, and he just never told Keith Haring. Um, I think it was. I think they just got into a heated argument, and it just got out of control. Um, and so uh, uh, Keith Haring came home, and he immediately made this one uh, where they're lifting him up, and. Uh, and paying tribute to it. So this is so this is the Andy Mouse section. So you will see this on a quiz. So I'll just say that right now. What is Andy Mouse? So make sure you write that down. Now, <laughs> Jasper Johns. Okay, so I have another Andy Warhol little video down below. It's nine seconds long. It's just telling you how he thinks about Andy Warhol. And it's funny because he basically tells him he makes great lunches. Uh, which is just... It's again. It's a what you know. This the serious question, but he gives it with a non-serious answer. Okay, so here, um, Jasper Johns. This now we're now we're leaving a little bit out of the '80s pop stars. Okay, and we're kind of going 
back and forth. Okay, so Jasper Johns is still alive today, and he's one of the he's the richest and most successful artist to ever live. Okay, um, in our in in the twentieth and twenty first century. Okay, um, he plays with the idea of pop. Okay, very well. All uh, right, he from the get go he was extremely successful. Now, what? He plays with the version of abstraction, all right, and he also makes you question what is pop, all right. Andy's is a little bit easier to accept, and John's is a little bit more trickier in the in the gr grand scope of things. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here, okay, the American flag. Can there be anything more pop than the American flag? Every country knows what the American flag looks like. You can go anywhere with an American flag, and everyone's going to know you're an American. All right, uh, it's the most recognizable country in the world. All right, um, you can even go to the moon, and it's there. Okay, so uh, so to use the flag, it was an, it, it's a no brainer. It, it's and it fits right into this uh, section. And so the pop generation accepted it, but also the minimalist abstraction group accepted it because it's not a really pretty flag. Now, if you notice the stars are a little off, just to let you know, Alaska and Hawaii were not connected at this point when this flag was made. So, a little shocking, okay? Uh, they weren't part of the uh, country yet, okay? And then he also did three flags. Now, and again, this was a very popular uh, body of work. Now, you're going to hear me use this name for the first time, and you're going to hear it again and again and again. Uh, there's, an, there's a critic named Clement Greenberg, okay? Clement Greenberg is a big component. He's literally what made um, uh, Jackson Pollock who he is. Uh, he was the authority on Jackson Pollock, but he was also the authority for abstract minimalist. Uh, basically, any movement that had to do with abstraction, uh, Greenberg really pushed it to the forefront and gave them a voice in literature. Okay, he's a writer, and he's a damn good writer, but, but you'll also find out how his writing power kind of got a little out of control. But but he loved Jasper Johns' work, and he wrote wonderful reviews, which made his work really easy to sell when a critic who is known for being the world's greatest critic is going, oh, I think he's absolutely wonderful. And um, so you might not love his work, but the critics do, okay? Just FYI, okay? And then there's a video of him talking about his work. So the image you saw there is him and a young man. Um, this is typically how he looks right now. But so click on the video. Watch it. It's about four minutes, I think, about him talking about his work. Um, then here we have his target. Okay, this is a Vietnam piece that he made. Um, this is his anti-war piece, okay? Um, he, de he deals with the American flag, which you would think he might be pro-war and pro, you know, um, our, our country. But during the Vietnam, uh, that was a really different situation. And so here he's talking about... Um, pro uh, anti-war because a lot of people during that time totally believed we should not have gone um, because we lost a lot of soldiers at that point um, and so he, he's basically saying this target right here this is what they should be wearing on their back okay now um, and that's a very political kind of a piece to think about that um, but a lot of younger people, when they see this shape, this target shape, and I've been talking about consumerism a lot in this in this PowerPoint, they see the target as a target logo for like the franchise, the the uh, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, the target store, and and that's not what this is about. This is not a franchise. This is a anti-war piece. Um, I chose a purposely one that was blue instead of red so you guys wouldn't uh, con uh, get confused. So it's not about Target, the grocery store. Okay, It's about uh, anti-war during Vietnam. All right. 
Um, the next piece, as you see here, um, is kind of his trademark, okay? This paint can uh, of solvent. So it's like a coffee can with brushes in it. Uh, this is his trademark. This is just like if you were to think about somebody who's a plumber, what would be on their business card, okay? Um, would it be a wrench and maybe a plunger, a toilet, a clogged pipe, maybe? Um, yeah, so... That's his image. This, he's basically making uh, a painter's artist logo in one of his paintings, and it became super successful. And he started doing what we call a visual language, okay? And you're going to hear me talk about this again uh, when we get to the, um, um, uh, what do you call it, the... Uh, Impressionist and post-impressionist. Uh, visual language is the way that the artist kind of uh, starts a language that you can read, that you know it's the art artist's work. And he uses his pieces and he replicates it over and over and over uh, in a style that it, it almost becomes repetitious. But then it also, when you first see it at first glance, you know, oh, that's a Jasper Johns. Now, here's one of his prints. Now these are how he makes made a majority of his money and if I had to say out of the group um, Jasper Johns is kinda like the Steve Jobs of Apple okay in the art world um, he was really good at marketing um, when he got famous and this piece is here on the right it's called numbers uh, he made an addition I think close to 80 of these um, when you think of a number think of one and look for the lines that make the number one think of number two and look for the lines that make the number two number three number four number five and the numbers start to magically appear uh, it's one of my favorite prints um, it's so simplistic so simple and it goes from zero to nine and then he this was a very successful print and so he bought this print or he, he made this print but then he was going to do the next piece he did one and then each number he did he did what we call a rainbow roll which is a, a blend of colors going across the plate and um, which which you see right here this yellow to red to purple um, and then in each number, he chose a famous art piece. So in here, in number seven, which is one of my favorite ones, it's got the Mona Lisa. Number four has the luncheon on the grass uh, piece. Um, and then so they, so uh, Crown Point Press is the place that printed this is uh, this piece. And when Crown Point got done with it, he looked at all the prints, and they looked on, on his first one, on number one, they looked good, but he said there's something missing. And he had already drawn one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and zero. He's already drawn them out, and they've already printed the edition in the rainbow roll, but he said there's something missing. And so he goes over to the stones, and he puts his hand into oil, okay, a greasy oil, and he slaps his hand onto each stone. And then he tells the master printer, he goes, I want you to put all those prints back onto the stones, and I want you to put my handprint in white on top. And uh, so it looks like I touched the... I touched it because he actually had trouble letting other people make his art for him. Uh, so, so when he he was he's a painter, not a printer. And so when he got done with it, he they, he felt better about his his handprint on there. And then he signed each one of them. Um, just to give you an idea how much, how well these sold, the number series print sold for twenty thousand dollars. Okay, twenty times eighty. You can do that simple math. Okay. And then one, then the number one came out, and he sold those for twenty thousand. Okay, now the the printing shop they get to have a little portion of their proofs that are made for them, and then when when an edition is fully sold out, they can then turn around and sell their copies for a higher price, which then sets up the price for the next bodies of prints that they make. So they had number one going out for 20000 then the print shop was selling them for $5,000 more and selling them for twenty-five. 
Well, then they did number two, and then they sold those for for twenty five thousand, and then the print shop did them for thirty, and then so on and so on and so on and so on. And before you knew it, the last body is a print. And if you bought number one, you were going to go all the way and buy zero. And the zero print, each one of them sold <clears throat> for about a hundred thousand dollars a print. Okay, and so. So right there, you take a hundred thousand uh, times eighty, and it's eight hundred thousand dollars on one print. Okay, so that's that's a quite a good return, right? And not including all the rest of the money he made from that. That right there could set most artists up for life, okay? And that's just one portion of a series of works, okay? Uh, so, like, when I tell you he's the richest artist alive, it's because of things like that. His infinity drawings, okay, these are... Okay, they're basically abstract lines that are continuous. They can, where the yellow matches at the top goes down to the bottom. If you were to take the paper and, and roll it into a circle, like a, like a tube, uh, the lines would match on the front, the top to bottom, and also from the left to right. Basically, though, this is, in my opinion, it's not my favorite part of his work. It's later in his career. Um... I'm not a fan of these. Um, it's glorified, um, uh, what do you call it, wallpaper, in my opinion. But some people really love them, and I always show them, because um, they are very important in this work. And here you can see someone publicly commissioned him to do this print. They have a solvent can, and then you see the uh, infinity line pieces. And so what makes me think is a lot of times people would see some some of his art in somebody's house and they'd be like they'd call him up and they'd say well, well can we have one of your pieces but we want to dictate and rich people love to do this to artists can can you make me a special piece sure comes with a special cost and so there's a lot of independent pieces where it has multiple themes going on in one piece um, and so this to me screams commission so, so you can see how he's very successful. Now, <clears throat> we're getting to my favorite artist, Robert Rauschenberg. I love this man. If, if there's an artist that I could be like, I would be like Robert Rauschenberg. This man uh, is un, it's just he's one of my favorite people. Um, he's the king of printmakers, okay? Uh, what I teach in my printmaking class is based off of Robert Rauschenberg's theories. Um, his art was so groundbreaking that artists didn't know how to, uh, art historians didn't know how to classify him. But there's something interesting about Robert Rauschenberg, okay? Uh, Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns are best friends. Now, Robert Rauschenberg got Jasper Johns into the into the art movement, okay? Got him into the gallery when he moved to New York. Uh, Johns lived on the top floor above him, and they lived in the same building. Robert was on the on the second floor. Johns was on the third, okay? And they became really good friends. And the only downside to all this, okay, uh, Robert Rauschenberg, it took him a little while to get popular, and and his best friends is Jasper Johns, and who is popular right out of the gate. Um, a lot of people believe it had to deal with that Johns had a little bit more money, had a good name, family, and Robert Rauschenberg is from Texas and fr came from a small country town, um, and from there. Uh, it was a lot harder when he got to New York because he came from a small upbringing. Um, and Johns went to Ivy League schools and Robert Rauschenberg went to art schools. Um, I've heard he's, he's dyslectic just like me, has trouble uh, reading and writing. Um, and, and, but what, what I like about him is the way he talks in his story. So when, if you're gonna, when you look at his videos, really kind of, he's got some great stories. And, and some of his work, as I show you, it's going to be kind of shocking in some aspects. Okay. Um, but, but the most important thing to understand about him is, is his upbringing as you look at his work. Okay. He came from Port Arthur, Texas. All right. 
and in Port Arthur, Texas, it's a small farm town. Um, it's mostly military, and so he did join the military. He became he was a paratrooper, and he was in the Korean War, and he gets done with that, and um, he served his time and gets out, and um, and then he realizes during the time when he was in in war, he wanted to be an artist and he wanted to go to art school. So he goes to art school in the Black Hills of. Uh, Arkansas, uh, the Black Hill School of Art, and gets a wonderful education from there. And they tell him, if you want to be successful, you better go to New York City. So he moves to New York City and finds a, a gallery pretty quickly that likes his work. And he gets an apartment, gets a little job here and there, tries to make some money. And um, But it took 10 years before his artwork started to really sell. And I tell this to a lot of artists all the time. You know, a lot of people think that they get out, the, they get into art school, they go to art school, they get done with art school, and they get into a gallery, and they feel like they're going to sell right off the bat. It takes time. And and I always tell people, I go, would you be an artist still if you didn't sell any art? And say if it took ten years, would you still be an artist? Okay. I've had years where I've had good art selling years. I've had years where I hadn't sold very well. And so it's just kind of one of those things. Uh, you kind of have to weed through that and kind of work through it. But in the end, if you know you're an artist, and a true artist, uh, the sales will come. And that's the way I kind of believe. So let's go into him. So, yeah, watch. This is his studio. So watch that video. Watching him go to his studio. And I like what he says about an artist, you know. Uh, you, you're kind of just... You're if you're an artist, you're an artist. That's that. That's it. That, that's the kind of question about it. Can you be trained to be an artist? Yes, but majority of the time, you're kind of born this way as an artist, uh, like anything, as a passion. So, so watch the video. It's like I think 50 seconds long. It's kind of neat. Now, um, here's his, uh, his performance art. Now, he got to New York and he started doing these performance art pieces and, uh, of him at NYU and roller skates acting like he's a paratrooper. Uh, it was not very successful. <laughs> and, um, and he almost looked a little silly um, in, these, in the pictures and the videos. Um, but what was interesting, he, he took those pictures and he turned them into prints. So like you see on the right there. And then he silk screened and he did these photo emulsion prints. And no one had ever seen these. Now, I teach this in my class to beginners on how to do this. And this is something in the 19... Uh, 50s no one was doing no one knew how to do it and here he's just experimenting doing these new versions of stuff and everyone's kind of like well that's cool but at the same time it wasn't quote unquote um, good art to be in a pantheon now for printmakers like myself we look at these and go wow look at what he did here look at this look at the layers and the textures and so he was he was changing the print world but he wasn't changing the art world at this point now here okay monogram it is a goat okay so now this is this is something interesting. He talks about in his in his story, and that's the next slide, and there's a video down below, and he talks about how he got this goat, okay? So here we go. We got a goat, and he finds it on the street. Now, what I like about his process here is he believes if you made a, a point right where you stand and you walk in a circle circumference around your area you can gather enough stuff to make an art piece. And now living in Manhattan, a mile and a lot of the stuff that's there, there's a lot of stuff you can get go through. And he would go on these daily walks looking for things to put into art. Um, and he stumbled upon this goat. Asked to buy it. Put it together. Now when he put this piece together, he you can see it's from 1955 all the way to 59. And so he kept trying and and putting it out there and changing it but then he put this tire around the goat 
and in his words, it just came together. Now, he did a tire print with Jasper Johns where they inked up a, a tire and, and, and drove down the street trying to make the world's longest print. Um, and so here... Uh, so they got this tire print that he, or this, this tire from the tire print, and they put it around the goat, and he's just like, it worked. It came together. It's what it needed to be. And so, um, and so then it's, it, it became kind of a, an interesting moment, because people, some people thought it was a joke. Some people didn't find it to be funny. Some people thought, what is this guy doing with a goat? But I'll tell you this. If we walk through a museum and you saw the goat piece, okay, you saw a monogram, and we looked around and walked all over the space, and I asked you, at the end of the day, what was the most uh, memorable piece in the museum? And I, I guarantee you, most of you would say the goat. What, what is up with the goat, okay? And then I'd have to go into and explain it, all right? Um, he's moving out of an era where... Uh, sculptors and painters are considered like godlike, and here he is coming in, and he's kind of trying to push the boundaries, um, and and it was successful. And this piece did sell recently for um, uh, ninety three million dollars recently, and I know it's a goat. <laughs> so anyway, and and so. Look at the video. Watch how they take care of the goat and the Guggenheim as they install it. And listen to how he talks about it. It's, it's interesting. Uh, here's one of his lithographs that he did with Jasper Johns. Um, they printed it, and then the piece exploded as they were printing it. And so a lithograph is something that you can make millions of, of prints from. And here they get one print, and they break the stone. It's because they didn't know how to do all the processes correctly. And I've worked in shops that stones are broken, and they sound like shotguns going off when they, when they pop. Um, and they are quite dangerous to be standing behind it when that happens. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, for a lithograph, he called, they titled it Accident. This is the first time he actually got some major pre uh, press and the print uh, community kind of accepted him as a printmaker for, for this accidental piece. Now, I know this might not be your taste of art, but during this point, abstraction was the biggest art form at that point. So everyone was doing abstraction art. So here, he's trying to just get his name out there and using Jasper Johns as, as kind of a catalyst, too. And, uh, and they won their competition, and, and then now this is, this is uh, held up at the... Uh, 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 I can't talk at the at the new National uh, Gal Art Gallery or Gallery of Art, okay, in uh, New York City, okay. <clears throat> we have here we have signs, okay. Uh, signs is a 1970s uh, piece. Here he's taking everybody who has ever passed away in the 1970s, uh, 60s, um, and so. And, I mean, that, that decade is, is intense, and those last five years were just super tough, um, the way it kind of just fell apart there. Um, I think after the death of uh, Martin Luther King, and uh, it, really, it really started to change. Um, and so here he's taking uh, his silk screens, and he's showing you the level of skill level he has when he prints and so he gets these prints pristine um, and it's one of his more popular imagery um, now Tracer uh, this piece is located in Kansas City when I went to school I looked at this piece quite often um, this picture is a little hard to see at the bottom what this piece is about it's about the execution of JFK. That car you see at the bottom is JFK's motor cave. And you can look at the bottom. You can actually see Jackie Onassis crawling over the hood at that one moment in this picture. Um, and so what is he basically saying? You remember, he's a, a military man, and he's basically talking about uh, how he uh, served his country. And so he's saying that JFK gave his life for his country. 
Now, I know that there's tons of propaganda and there's tons of conspiracy theorists out there. Whatever you may believe or don't believe, um, the man did die and he served us as president and it was a shocking event nonetheless. And to even do an art piece is kind of risque and a lot of people thought it was suicide, but he but felt that he had the right to do it as a, as a soldier and as someone that served for our country. And so he did do these and he actually, it turned out to work in his favor in a lot, in a large way. Uh, retroactive 1. Now, we have Retroactive 2 at the Dallas Museum of Art. Uh, this piece is a 40 foot by 60 foot uh, gigantic piece. Um, it had to be built into the museum, had to be stretched on, on the on the, on in the museum floor and hung on the wall. Um, when you make pieces that big um, it, and a museum buys it, it's kind of a good thing. No one will take it down because it's so freaking large. Um, so if you go into the, Met, uh, the Dallas Museum of Art, and the DMA, <clears throat> it's right there in front of the first thing you do when you walk in. And here they're just paying tribute to JFK at the museum. But that's what also what uh, Rauschenberg's trying to do. And, and he's just like trying to do the same thing, but also he's trying to pay a little kind of tribute to Andy Warhol and Roy Lichtenstein in the same aspects. He's kind of using them as a catalyst for his own art, and he's piggybacking, like I like to use that term. Uh, Booster is a lithograph and screen print combination. Um, now in 1967, uh, X-rays were not that popular, and what is he doing? Well, he'd get a lot of his imagery from from dumpsters, and so he picked up this trash, and he decided that he was going to uh, use this, and well, one of the things he stumbled upon was these human body X-rays, and he wanted to put that into a stone, so he transferred a Xerox, or a... Uh, a a x-ray onto a stone which no one had ever done before so again printmaking terms groundbreaking uh, sounds uh, was uh, one of the pieces that I fell in love with in, in, in college um, I still love this piece um, here, um, these are sheets of plexiglass, half inch thick, and he silk screened on one side, and then he sandblasted portions of the chairs uh, that were silk screened, so it gave this kind of frosted look. And then he just put simple shop lights behind it. Uh, this show that he did was one mile long throughout a museum, and you had to walk through it all. It was just continuous art, one after another for one mile. Uh, really kind of a neat, neat experience. Uh, if you ever get a chance to see one of those shows, it's wonderful. Uh, solstice is where he allows the viewer to change his art. He he silk screened tons of imagery uh, on these sheets of glass and these doors you can walk through. And as you walk through, you can move the piece where you want it to be. And he's allowing the viewer, when you look on the outside, that you change the way it looks by the way you walk through it. Okay. Erasing de Kooning. Okay. This is a tricky piece, and a lot of people get a little, uh, like, scra they scratch their head on this piece. Um, and I did a little uh, piece kind of uh, go reacting to this. Now, down below, there's a, there's a video uh, on it, and you can hear Rauschenberg talk about uh, William de Kooning. Now, William de Kooning was the master at that time. Uh, he was an abstract expressionist. He's as important to the art world as Jackson Pollock, but most of you don't know who de Kooning is, William de Kooning, but you know who Jackson Pollock is, so I focus on that in the color section. Um, so basically what he decided to do is he kind of friended William de Kooning, but, um, but he he wasn't a threat to the abstract group because he wasn't working like them. And he basically asked William de Kooning, hey, um, I'd like to do a project. It's kind of a weird thought, but uh, I wanted to see if you're down for it. And he basically proposed that 
um, could I erase one of your piece art pieces? Now, William de Kooning is a really tough kind of guy, and so um, he was expecting him to say no, and then that'd be the end of the art piece, and it would never happen. But he said yes, and which was shocking. And uh, and you can see in the video, he's a kind of kind of. Sh I love that he brings a bottle of Jack too, by the way, um, <laughs> to talk to him, and um, and so. So what William de Kooning said to him, basically, I'm going to give you something that's really tough to erase. And it took him a month to erase this piece of paper that has you know, all those ingredients, charcoal, crown, uh, oil paint. And it takes a while to erase all that. And then he got it to the perfect whites, is what he called it, the all whites. And on the back is the... Um, is the original image and we have no clue what the original image is so the documentation is behind this piece and the only people that know what it looks like is Rauschenberg and de Kooning and the framer that's it okay so I would love to see what it looks like and so would many other art historians but that's what's kind of the great thing about it and now an art historian they get upset with this because this could be the next Mona Lisa inside that frame but we'll never know because Rauschenberg has destroyed it as in in their world and 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 what Rauschenberg I love says at the end of it, he goes, "Well, what do you think about it?" And he says, it's "Simply, it's poetry." Yeah, it's poetry. It's it's kind of like you want to see it and you want to know about it because you can't. Okay, and that's and that's what's so great about this piece. Now, I did a series. Uh, there's a there's a an artist. Uh, his name is uh, Thomas Kincaid, and in, he's he's mostly in charge of those starving artist sales where you can go buy cheap art. Um, and he's a painter who's known for having these little gallery art galleries in the mall of his paintings, and they are worth something, but they're not worth as much as some people believe they are. You'll never see a Thomas Kincaid in, in a museum, never. And so, um, and so I was at a little Greek restaurant and I see this little circle, um, lighthouse and I go over and look at the circle lighthouse and, and, uh, it says, uh, Deco oh, not Deco um, Thomas Kincaid lighthouse and it was 60 bucks. And so I asked my wife, I said, I, I think we should buy this piece. And she's like, why <laughs> knowing that i don't really like this artist and so uh so i have an art piece i want to do with it in mind and she was like well 60 bucks we don't have that and we're, we're brand spanking new married you know 60 bucks was a lot and i told her i said i wouldn't i wouldn't eat lunch uh out i'd, I'd make my sandwiches and take it to work and she was like okay fine so she lets me she lets me buy it so I get home with it, and she asks me, what are you going to do with it? And I'm like, I'm going to erase it. And so she, she was like, wait, so we just bought an art piece for 60 bucks, and you're going to erase it now? And I went, yep. And so she got kind of ticked at me. Well, in the process of, of uh, getting into my studio and, and setting up, uh, she looked it up online, and it was worth like $1,000 or $800 or something like that. And so I was, and, and she's like, we could sell it. And I was like, eh, I'd rather destroy it. <laughs> and so, so of course, she got mad at me. And uh, so the Dallas Museum of Art was doing a young Texas talent competition. So I erased that little canvas uh, to the bare bones. It was just nothing but canvas when I got done with it. And I called it a, a race in a Kandinsky as a joke. And uh, and it was so funny because uh, when I entered into the show, it got in, and we hung it on the wall, and the press ate it up. They loved every minute of it. And so I got a, a pretty good Kickstarter for my art career, which helped me get into grad school with this. And, uh, and then immediately I had my email connected to the piece and I had bids going on it so I had one person I didn't put a price down because I didn't know how much to charge and so one person said that they'll give me two thousand dollars and I was like ooh two thousand dollars well then uh, another person came by and, and bid it and said and I was like 
and uh, and and gave me a bid for four thousand dollars. But the two thousand dollar guy emailed me first, so I go back to him and I said, I, "I'm sorry, uh, I got a bid for for two thousand um, dollars for this piece, uh, or four thousand dollars, and you wanted two thousand. Uh, I'm going to take the four thousand. And then I got an immediate reply back, and uh, they said they'd give me uh, they'd give me eight thousand dollars for the piece." And so I went back to the guy at 4000 I said, the original purchaser came back and said that they wanted 8000 They would give me $8,000 for the piece. And, uh, and so immediately uh, the person responded back, they can have it. And so, uh, so the $60 piece that I got in kind of little hot water for selling turned around and I sold it for $8,000. And so, and it's all based off of this theory. Now, the funny part about it is, if you don't know what racing de Kooning's about, you don't get the piece. And if you do know what racing, you understood it 100%. Now, the weird part about my emails, besides the selling of the piece, I got a ton of backlash from rich people who had William de Kooning, or not de Kooning's, uh, Kandinsky's, not Kandinsky's, uh, Kincaid's pieces, and they were um, very upset that I destroyed this piece, and and uh, they wanted to know what piece it was, and I I told them the documentation was the title, and so I said, and there's over 150 of them available, so there's others out there. I didn't erase an original, so um, so it's funny how some people got upset with that and thought it was a waste of money. So, but to me, it was lucrative, and I was out of the doghouse, and I didn't have to do dishes that week. Uh, <laughs> so, anyway. So, watch this video. It's a really good video. Highly recommend it. Now, um, here we go. We have uh, the, the reason the tire is around the monogram is because of this print. You can see here it's 20 sheets of paper um, mounted on fabric and and he, him and Johns uh, drove the car and, and printed out this sheet and, and they used that tire and so and trying to make the longest print ever. Sorry, it's been a long morning. <clears throat> so, and there's a video on that so check out the video. It makes, makes more sense as you go through it. I know most of you guys are getting tired too. It's a long video. Now, this is the last one of Rauschenberg, and we're getting down to the end. We only have, we only have two more artists, I think, um, to get through. Um, so here's Glass Tire, okay? Now, this is Rauschenberg's last piece. He died shortly after making this. Um, and uh, there is a group uh, that is a review for Texas artists, and their website is called Glass Tire. So they're in the next thing I'm going to be showing in a second. But they re this they reviewed this piece and named their website after them or the review site after this art piece. Um, and again, it goes back with the with the print. It goes back with the monogram. So it's a very important piece to Rauschenberg, and it was his final piece. But here's Glass Tire, okay, uh, there's a little video down be down below of them at, a, at an art gallery, and it kind of lets let you see what an art festival or art galleries look like. They're a lot of fun people. If you've never been to one, first of all, majority of them give away free alcohol. If you're over 21, free wine and beer, um, and you can go to a couple of them that are in local areas. Uh, you might see two or three of them. Uh, you have to do um, some kind of review this uh, during these three weeks. Uh, like I said, it can be music, theater, dance, anything, uh, something that celebrates the arts, and you have to do a, a six-paragraph review on it. Um, they do a really good job. If you want to look at some of their reviews and see how they write about reviews, excellent place to, for research and and if you do choose a review that that they are that they have done and uh, of, of a place that you want to go to and you do a review and you copy and paste their text and you don't think I won't find it just FYI I will uh, so don't don't plagiarize I want your words not somebody else's okay and here is his car All right, the studio. Uh, anyway, okay, Frank Stella. 
Okay, so now this artist, now there's a video down there. Now, you do not have to watch the whole 10 minutes. This man talks extremely boring in his video. Um, he is a very intellectual guy. He teaches at NYU. Uh, I've had students take his class and uh, for his art art and theory course and it is really intense they say but he he is a brilliant man um now at the um north park mall they have a large collection of his work uh if you're interested they have some of his later works um now one of the things he's one of the few artists in the abstract era that bashes jackson pollock and he basically says i'm better than you no, no matter what you say and um do I agree? Yes, I agree. Um, he is better. And he he is pretty much the father of two-dimensional design for 2D design. Uh, most people who teaches that class, they use his formulas for a lot of their design projects. So let me get into their work. So here you see uh, the design elements in this piece. All right. Circles and squares and blending of different varieties and colors, pushing and pulling. I love this piece. See how the, the bottom two circles, uh, you see the pink that goes across the bottom circle on the right, and, and how that opening void can, is, is cut off, but you, in your mind can easily connect those two, the yellow, the blue, and the, the pink ones coming across there. And his and his, and these are uh, the actual uh, canvases. He does circular canvases, which are really kind of neat too, as well. His car is probably my favorite out of all the artist cars. In the 1970s, uh, he had this really kind of retro look with browns and earth tones, and that was real popular in 1970. And then here is um, um, his, his basically his breakdown um, now uh, of of taking two circle uh, taking two circles and a square. Now I do a similar project. I do three squares within a square. Um, but here he does two circles, and you can see the top circles and the bottom circles, and you can see the left and right side circles, and they're cut in half. And then there's a square format in the center. But at first glance, most people see like a pretty butterfly. But there's more to that than just that butterfly shape. Now, I put this little animation about Clement Greenberg um, and talking about this group and this genre of the abstract expressionist and the, and the abstract minimalist um, moving into um, uh, Johns and, uh, and Rauschenberg. Okay, and so it gives you a little insight on Clement Greenberg. Uh, watch that video. It, it, it really will help. And, it's, and I like the uh, illustrations in it. It's a really good video. Okay, we're coming to uh, one of my favorite artists of the whole, the whole genre, too. Um, besides Rauschenberg, Chuck Close is a... Uh, is a very personal artist to me. Uh, I've actually had the pleasure of meeting him two times, um, and now I do tell the story about him. Now we are going into the genre of photorealism. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about him, then I'm going to tell the story about him. Uh, it, it will take me a little bit of time. So uh, this is this is one. This is why this lecture is so freaking long. Okay. So. Uh, first thing, just kind of play it all out. Okay, this image you see here is one of the images I helped create uh, in a print shop. I worked for a print shop. Um, this is a self-portrait of him. He um, he takes a photograph of himself or other people, and he breaks it down into these kind of abstract forms. And there's a reason behind that, okay? Um, but early in his career, here he is with uh, uh, a self-portrait of himself here smoking a cigarette and you look at that picture and you you see this and you kind of think wow that looks really great uh, as a photograph but this is a drawing this is all done with graphite okay um, and so he grids out his drawings when he was in his early 
youth, and he wanted to get it as close to the realist photo as possible. So right here, what this artist is doing, he's doing something very similar, going back to the pop thinking, the theory, you might want to write this down, Chuck Close, okay, takes unpopular people, and by the art, it makes them popular. Andy Warhol took popular people, all right, by the po people's popularity, it made the art popular. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to go off? And they set up a whole new motion of art, okay, by photorealists. And this is super popular on Facebook and Instagram and all these things. I see people trying to replicate his style. Um, it is a neat style. Now, the image you see of the, the lady on the left, uh, she looks like a model that you might have known if you're popular with models in the 90s, Kate Moss. It is not Kate Moss. Okay, this was made in the 60s. Kate Moss wasn't even born. This was actually his next-door neighbor, that uh, one of the ladies that he fell kind of in love with. I guess he liked her a lot. Uh, but you can see what he looked like versus what she looked like. And they got to talking, and he asked if she would be okay to take a portrait. And in this picture, I love because she gives this look like she's not quite sure why she's there, right? And so and so he takes her picture, and then from that picture, he draws all those little freckles. And after this picture was made and, and, and put into museums and galleries, she became popular. People were stopping, are you that one of the models for Chuck Close? And so she became super popular because of this, okay? Now, just to let you see the size of these drawings, they are not small at any stretch of the imagination. Um, and when you walk by these these pieces, now I know today's time we we can print out a photograph that size on canvas and it looks great. But back in the 1970s and even late 60s, uh, to get something of that quality, it was not it was unheard of. There was no way that. The, photos could be made that big and here he is doing it and making it realistic and looking like a photograph and there is something about them when you can see all the little brush strokes so I'm going to scoop over to the next one when you look at those brush strokes of this man's mustache he's going in there he darkens out the shape but then he goes back in with his eraser and he goes back in with with a little bit of white pencil and he pulls out the shapes and all the little details um, he uses the grid uh, to help get all his placement across so he can make it any size that he wants as you can see here okay so there he is standing up against his work and now he's a very tall man he's about six four six five but if black and white doesn't shock you how about color okay so the image on the right is a drawing that is not a photograph that is all colored then okay now there is a time period between the piece you see on the right and the piece you see on the left the piece you see on the right took him about a year to do then he had a horrible accident he had like a brain aneurysm that <clears throat> basically it didn't kill him but it stopped at his spine and it basically paralyzed him uh, from the waist down and sometimes his arm that he that he draws with uh, was was affected by this uh, this uh, this horrible accident now he's in a wheelchair permanently now when you look at the piece that's on the left okay that took him three years to do versus the one piece that took him one year to do um, and he kind of has a cross stitch kind of a with it um, he could not get the details that's as detailed as he could get as he could get at that point um, but that's some parts of it that makes his work so beautiful and and some of the parts that I love about his work is the other ones yeah if he kept doing them they'd been great but they'd been like all right just another photograph that's been drawn okay what we'll to do but then when once the accident happened I think the accident made him a better artist and so here he's using his thumbprints okay dipping his little thumb into or not his little thumb his thumb into a pad of ink and then he's multi pressing on the piece of paper to give the values like you see on the right on the left he's just doing simple little X patterns 
Now, <clears throat> here he is, okay, in his, in his gallery, and you can see on the left at the top, um, there he is uh, working on a piece of uh, a painting right there, and you can see how he's gridded out the the photograph, and he's gridded out the canvas. Now he can't stand to do his canvas, so uh, there's a hole cut into the floor, and it's got a little conveyor belt, and it can move to the height that he needs as he works on it. Okay, there down below is him trying to just trying to see which show he wants to put his pictures into. Um, and there's his assistant, Patrick. Okay. Uh, Patrick goes with him everywhere. Okay. And then so you have right here uh, for this Chuck Close portion uh, where he's looking at himself and he's trying to get, and you can see the, the image, how close it is. Here, let me zoom in a little bit on this one. Okay. <clears throat> now, here's where I will tell you the story about Chuck Close and our first encounter. Uh, this is, uh, I've asked students, should I tell this? And, and every student agrees. This is one of the best stories of the semester for you, for my class. Um, when I was in undergrad, I worked at a, at a print shop. And uh, this print shop I worked at uh, wasn't the best place for, for me. <laughs> uh, the owner and I did not get along, and I worked for him for free. And most people would have quit, but I'm one of those people, when I say I'm going to do something, I do it and I want to learn the craft, even if I do get abused <laughs> at, the, at the space. So here at this shop where I was working at, I was the first to arrive. I cleaned the shop. Um, I would set up the shop, get everything ready for the day, and the owner would come in, and then, um, and then so the rest of the printers would too as well. And but I'd have everything prepped and ready to go for the day. And as I'm getting ready and setting up, all of a sudden I hear the downstairs conveyor belt uh, for the elevator opening uh, firing on, and so then the guest artist was coming up the uh, up the escalator and I asked who was coming up the elevator and the master printer said well it's uh it's the artist and so all of a sudden the door opens up and I see these circle rim glasses ball headed man in a wheelchair coming through the through the door now there's a long window before you get into our shop as they're coming down the hallway and I freak out I lose my, I just lose it right there, and I am clapping, and I am acting like probably a young girl who's seen Hannah Montana at the time. That was a reference I was using at this. It might be like Hannah, it might be like Taylor Swift today. Uh, it's like I'm seeing Taylor Swift, and I'm a little girl. I'm, I freaked out, and the gal, and the master prayer is like, calm down. <laughs> And I'm like, that's freaking Chuck Close. I'm like yelling, I'm like pointing at him. And Chuck's looking at me like, what a weird kid. And so, anyway, he comes in, we look at the plate, and we're working on an image of a portrait like this. He was having a show, and we were trying to finish it up for this, for this show. And so we only had to do three colors on the, on the print. Well... So when I, whenever you're first to arrive, you get to work on the art piece. So I decide uh, that I, I realize I get to actually touch a Chuck Close print. So I was really excited. Now <clears throat> uh, we get divvied out our jobs. Uh, the inker is the is one of the special jobs. Uh, paper is another job that's really important because you actually touch the print and. Um, and then the press operator is another important job. I got stone washer. Okay, I had to wet the stone. Okay, it's the worst job of the bunch. It's so easy a monkey could do it. And obviously I'm about to screw it up. Okay, so I, I get it and the, the ma master printer comes up to me and tells me, if you screw up any of these prints, they're worth $90,000 a print. And so immediately my heart's now in my throat. I'm like, thanks. So, uh, so now I go over and I, I wet my sponges into the bowl and I wet the stone with the image of, of, of it on there. And then I, and when I put down the water, I put a little too much water. Now, I quickly get the water fixed and, uh, and, and the master printer goes, well, that's one strike, John. And so now I get three strikes and I'm out. And so, uh, so next one I do it and, 
And this time I watered it perfectly, but I left a little tiny sliver uh, available on the plate. So at that point, I had to quickly, before the inker hit it, I had to touch it real fast to make sure it was wet. And then the master printer goes, well, that's two, John. And so the next one, I'm getting ready to squeeze the sponge, and then Chuck Close is like, you got it, John, and I squeeze too, too hard. And all the water goes all over the stone. At this point, I know it's my Shark 3, so I'm just kind of click quickly fixing it before before I get yelled at and the master printer goes well, I strike three John so I turn around and throw my sponge into the water and I'm like cussing like son of a bitch <laughs> and I'm like and so I, I didn't even get the chance to even print it and so so I was really upset so I go over to where I normally go when I get my three strikes, there was this area of stones that were uh, in a shelf, and I'd go grab one of the stones, and and uh, you can't tell by the picture, but I'm fairly a big guy, so I pick up the stone, and it weighs about 100 pounds, and I'm carrying it across the shop, and Chuck comes over and rolls over to me, and, and says, why'd they make you quit? And I go, well, after my third strike, I'm out, and, uh, and uh, he... And so he was like, oh, okay. And then as I'm carrying the stone, uh, Chuck Close looks at me and goes, man, I'd love to carry a stone like that. And I go, and I was joking. I said, why don't you put your your chair on the end of it and we can roll it over uh, And because uh, this bitch gets heavy. Well, the moment I said that, I can feel the lasers coming out of the master printer's eyes at the back of my head. And I turn around and look at him, and he's just shooting me this look like, you, I can't believe you just said that. And <laughs> so, anyway, so I go over, and I, I have to grind the surface of the stone completely smooth for the next artist and get it prepped and ready. And by this point, I've been doing it for almost a year, so I'm pretty good at it. So I get done with it, and it's about lunchtime. <clears throat> and then Chuck Close comes over to me and says, um, would you like to uh, go, are you, it's about lunchtime, don't you think? And, and I'm like, oh yeah, and I can't wait, I've been thinking about my lunch all day. And he goes, oh really, what are you, you going to have for lunch? And I tell him, I was like, oh I, made, I got paid yesterday, and like I said, I was a poor college student. So I had a fried bologna and grilled cheese sandwich, I had a peach, cottage cheese, banana, uh, a thing of milk, and and then a Coke, and Fritos. And I couldn't wait for that. I mean, that, that right there is like my perfect lunch, <laughs> okay? And so, so I'm so excited. And so the, uh, then all of a sudden Chuck Close looks over at the group and he tells everybody, he goes, hey, uh, I'm getting kind of hungry and I think I'm going to go get lunch. And so the master printer is like, yeah, that sounds good. Why don't you go get some lunch? We'll work, keep working on the print. And since I wasn't working on the print, and he said, I don't know Kansas City real well. How about if I take John with me? And I'm like, oh. So I grab my little brown sack, and I'm like, suckers, peace out. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm, I'm extremely ecstatic to go with them. So we go down the elevator, and I'm like, you know, uh, if you kind of can picture uh, Jack Black and Schoolhouse Rock, that's kind of how I was like, you know, kiss my butt as I'm walking out the door. <laughs> so, um, so we get down and we get in the car, and and so he asks me, where do I want to go to eat lunch? And I go, and I go, well, I go, I don't know. There's a there's a Wendy's down the street and it has a good dollar menu, and then there's a you know Subway. Um, it's pretty close by, and then there's a mom and pop sub place, and I've eaten there a couple times, and it's pretty good. And and he was like, no, 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 I want to eat at some place that you sit down. So I had to think about where am I going to go that I'd like to go to sit down. And I only had 20 bucks in my pocket, so I, I was not expecting him to pay for my meal. So I thought, well, there's this one place, and it's over by Kansas City Art Institute where I went, and uh, and I walk by it almost every day. And it's called the Cheesecake Factory. And he starts laughing. He's like, cheesecake for, for lunch? I go, there's no wrong time for cheesecake. And so um, so we go <clears throat> over to that area and uh, we get a, a table. Now, I've never eaten there. And I didn't know that the menu was like a little book. So so I look through and I figure out what I want. And I, I get meatloaf there every time. That's my, my go-to. So I get my meatloaf. And... 
you as if you've eaten there, the portions are enough to feed three, two to three people. And so I'm a college kid, and I wolf that food down like there was no tomorrow. Now, as we're sitting there, and I'm stuffing my face, uh, he. I'm asking him questions, and he's quickly answering them, but he's more interested in me, and he keeps asking me all these questions, and I'm like, okay, and and so I started telling him about an art piece I was working on, because he was just kind of curious about me, and so I told him about this art piece I was working on. The piece I was working on was a, a dress for my wife. Um, I was doing all these self-portraits, uh, and I found myself having trouble doing all the self-portraits. And uh, I didn't like any of them. And so it's not because I didn't love my wife. It's just it just didn't look like her to me. And a lot of people said they did, but I just didn't like them. And so I decided at that point uh, that I would do a wedding dress. And so I did. Uh, I took every love letter, and we wrote each other love letters all the time, a couple times a week. And I took every love letter, and I had over 800 love letters. Uh, and that at that time, we were like seven years dating and so I told her I said um, um, I was gonna do her uh, take her love letters and do something special with them so um, so I bought a size 6 wedding dress and tore it apart and glued all the love letters together and I just at that point had a group of ladies come help me sew it back together and I was telling them about the wedding dress and he tells me at, at dinner he goes I'd love to see it and I'm like Chuck, you're, you're like a god. If I recognized you in two seconds hopping out of an elevator, that campus, it would be like the Beatles coming, to t coming into the campus. People would freak out. And he looked at me and goes, well, you're a big guy. You can keep the students off of me. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I could do it. And I knew a back entrance. So we went through the back entrance. And so we get into the building that we're going to at my school. And, and I... I I opened the door, and my professor, who who's given a lecture, all of a sudden he uh, uh, he looks over, and there I am with Chuck Close going into my studio, and he's like, "What the heck is John Taylor doing with Chuck Close?" So Chuck Close sees the dress and immediately loves it, and and uh, and uh, and so then my professor comes into the my studio and. Like, what are you doing, John? And I introduce, I go, Chuck Close, Hugh Merrill, Hugh Merrill, Chuck Close. All right. <laughs> and so, and I kind of wave my arms around, like, awkwardly. And, and so, I'm very nervous. And so, <clears throat> at the end of our time, we get back into the car. Now, part of the story I skipped is at the end of our dessert, and I ate my meal, I ate the cheesecake. I even ate Chuck Close's cheesecake and the leftover he couldn't eat. <laughs> and, and then at the end of the meal, he bought, uh, he went to the menu and listed like six or seven entrees and then got a whole ream of cheesecake, a whole, a whole cake of cheesecake assorted and paid for it, individual slices and all. And I was ready to pay my portion, but he told me to keep my money. And then we get back into the car after being at Kansas City and he looks at me and he goes, John, he goes, uh, now we got to go to your apartment. And, and I look at Chuck and I go, Chuck, Chuck, Chuck. I go, I think you're, I think you're a nice guy. Don't get me wrong, but, um, I don't swing that way. I, I don't, uh, I'm not down that, I don't, I'm not down like that. And he goes, and he started laughing. He goes, no, you idiot. I'm not propositioning you and and I go and by the way you couldn't I live on the fifth floor of a building there's no elevator I couldn't carry you up there if I wanted to and he died laughing and he goes no he goes I want to take this food that we bought to you and I thought he was going to give the food to the other printmakers he was like no one should be that happy like you were earlier to eat a fried bologna and grilled cheese sandwich and when I watch you wolf down that food you act like you haven't eaten in a week and I go well I really hadn't eaten that much in a week <laughs> and, so, and he goes and he goes yeah he goes this is all your food and I was like oh my god wow thank you uh, yeah I live two blocks up so we drop the food off I run the food upstairs open the door put it in the refrigerator my roommates are there and I tell them they can eat some of it but if they ate it all I'd kick their butt and, and then uh then 
then we went back to the print shop, and, and I thought that would be the end of the story. And I graduated, and I thought well, this was, that was a wonderful encounter. Um, we we send each other messages on um, uh, emails, and we became kind of friends. And um, and then I was in New York City uh, the the next uh, few months after I graduated, and I was at this print conference, and he was the guest speaker at Rutgers University, and so. At, at, at Rutgers, he's given a talk, and he looks down, and he sees me uh, before it starts, and he waves to me and, and says, ask me how I'm doing, and, I, I tell, and he told me at the end of his talk, he wanted to talk to me, which I was like, wow, okay. So, uh, the, uh, the next, uh, after the, the thing was over, I was in this gigantic tent. Now, I had a VIP pass to this this conference and so they had ultimate sushi all the sushi you'd ever want in this place all these sushi bars and all this beer and liquor and everything so I have two bottles of beer in my hand and a plate full of sushi and all of a sudden I feel this tug at my at my uh, belt uh, loop strap and I look down and there's Chuck close behind me and and he, he looks at me, and I got a plate full of food and two beers in my hand. And he's like, well, I can tell you didn't lose your appetite. And, and so uh, I was like, nope, nope, you know me, free food. And so uh, he goes, well, that's why I came over to ask you if you're interested. There is a, uh, a dinner with all a group of artists, and I'd like you to be my guest. And I'm like, oh, well, I'd love to. But uh, my dad's with me, and I don't want... Um, I don't want to leave him here. Um, and he's like, well, your dad's a printmaker, right? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, bring him along. He'll, he'll love the, the, the dinner. And so I go over to my dad. I go, Chuck Close invited us to dinner. And do you want to go? And he was like, yes. And so, so we went to like a Morton Steak restaurant. I, I think that's what it was in New York. And as we get there, uh, we, op we go into the room and... I start freaking out like I did when I saw him for the first time, and he could see my eyes get bigger and bigger. And so, wh who was it, who was in this in this dinner? It was Terry Winters, Jasper Johns, uh, some major big name artists, and I am freaking out. And I'm just like, "Holy cow! Who's that? do you know who that is?" And he's like. And he and then my professor was there too, and uh, he's like breathe, <laughs> and so we uh, ended up um, having a lovely dinner. I got to meet some really great people, and then at the end of all this, <clears throat> um, he tells the waiter to pack all the food that was not eating eaten and. Um, and give it to me, and they had like huge lobster tails for appetizers at the beginning, and so I had like three lobster tails, about four or five steaks in a bag, and I look at him, I'm like, what am I going to do with this? I'm in a hotel in New York, and he was like, well, you'll find somebody to give it to. I'm sure you're going to hang out with some college kids tonight. I'm like, yes, I am, and so, so I took all that food to um, to a fraternity at Rutgers that I made friends with these guys and I they're having a party and so I show up with steak and lobster and I'm not part of the fraternity but they let me in with steak and lobster I don't think and they thought I was the weirdest guy they've ever met so hung out with them that night but uh, the morning of <clears throat> my dad was told me that Chuck wanted to have us come over for breakfast so we went over to his his apartment or his his brownstone house. And we're, we're at his place, and so we're looking at it, um, his work, and he's talking to us, and we had a simple breakfast of grape nuts. And at the end, I asked him, I said, I said, why did you uh, choose to do all these nice things for me? He said, there's something about you. And he goes, I, I really do feel you... You care about people, and I believe someday you're going to be famous. And when you get famous, I want you to do what I did did for you for another person. And and it really kind of made me feel honored that he thought of me that way. And um, and so <clears throat> that day he took my picture and my father's picture. And I I don't know if 
if you've ever used it, if you will ever use it, but I hope so one day. That'd be kind of neat to go into one of his shows and see my face done. Um, but it's one of those moments where you kind of look back and go, wow, that's, that's really cool. Um, so he took a picture of me, and then, um, and then about two years ago, my mom's having an art show in San Francisco, and he was on the first floor, and my mom was on the second floor of the art show and um, and so mom got to meet him for a moment and uh, and when they were talking uh, she said my son tells this lovely story of encountering you and uh, and then all of a sudden she he starts putting the pieces together before my mom says my name and um, and he goes is your son John Taylor and uh and she was like yes and she goes i just love him and so and we were friends on facebook um but he's not chuck close on facebook so don't think you can find him um he does comment on certain things here and there which is kind of nice um so anyway just wanted to tell that story and so what so when you meet artists you know it really opened my eyes there's a lot of good artists out there and there's good people out there so here's one of some of his pieces. Uh, here's one of his. Uh, he was a diehard Democrat. So, uh, and when uh, uh, Bill Clinton moved into Harlem, Bill Clinton actually moved right down the street from him. So, seemed perfect. So here's some of him talking about a studio. Uh, there's also him in his wheelchair. This is his uh, gyro wheelchair that allows him to go upstairs. And then here is um, uh, us working. This is one of the things I got to work on uh, uh, when I went to I went to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and, and worked with uh, uh, Tamron Press for for a summer. And we got to do another piece, and so I got to meet him again here at this process. And he, he thought I was just following him, which is kind of silly and funny at the same time. Um, but this is a six-hour print. Uh, made in one day, but it's sped up into one minute, so hope you enjoy. Now, Don Eddy, okay, is the next photorealist. Now, Don Eddy does the other side, okay, like I said about Andy Warhol, you have popular people, okay, for and that works with the Chuck Close, with the unpopular people making them popular. Now you have Don Eddy, so write this portion down. So Don Eddy he does what Andy Warhol was doing when he walked into the store, okay? So when he walked into a, a grocery store, he saw the arrangements. So Don Eddy's is taking, of, and there's a video as well right here, and he's taking the pictures, okay, of the storefronts, okay? And he's showing the arrangements just like how Andy Warhol saw the products. So he's showing the actual products, okay, in their display cases. But he does more than that. He also shows the reflection of what 1974 looked like in the windows. Okay, and so these pieces were definitely uh, wonderful uh, for this time. And uh, Andy Warhol loved them and for this period. And he became instantly s successful with these pieces. Here's another version. This one is by far... Um, one of his favorite, uh, Andy Warhol's favorite pieces. And I love this one because you can actually see through the shop and you can actually see like a little old lady looking for something. You can see a manager pointing something out. But then you can see the reflection of the building. You can see the aisles. And it does this push and pull motion from the background to the foreground behind you as a viewer. Um, it has this wonderful play about it. And Andy Warhol loved this piece. Okay. Now... Here's, if that's not impressive, here it is in silver. Silver is a beast of a color. It's difficult to do, okay? And here he is uh, doing that with silver. Um, and I also ask questions in my class is, if you notice the top two rows has a green glass tone uh, for the shelf. And I think he purposely did that so that the glass could be shown. Okay, so it doesn't look like floating silver objects in the room space. Here is the other portion of his piece. 
Now, uh, this is glass shelves with glass uh, uh, wine glasses on top of it. And so you see all the glass on top of glass. And, and notice that when you do glass, what's the dominant color there? It's black. And most people, when they do glass, and they're not trained to draw glass, they draw glass as white. So, But to be honest, glass is mostly black, just FYI. Um, now, the only thing I didn't say at the beginning of him, because I'm trying to rush through at the end here, is <clears throat> when you look at this piece, and you look at everything about it, um, and you look at everything he's done, his popularity, he, he was instantly successful. And you look at those vi that video that I have posted below, the video is interesting because he doesn't... Um, really talk about what happened later and he got too successful too fast and he went into hiding and he ba I think he moved to Canada and basically became a recluse and basically fell off the art world map and in 1990 came back and wasn't as successful um, I think the times have have uh, shown that his style had become um, perfected and more people have done it and it wasn't so special anymore and so it's kind of a shame in some aspects but um it, it's it's a neat video listening to him talk I, i'm not a huge fan of his newer stuff but at least that's the only video that's out there that i've ever found so anyway we are completely done i know this was a three hour video so sorry <laughs> all right um, take the quiz now after this so it's fresh in your mind.